Uh, good morning, everybody, ministers, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 11th ministerial meeting of the Arctic Council. It's a pleasure for me to see you all in Rovaniemi. Uh, I now propose the meeting agenda for approval with one change. Instead of signing of the Rovaniemi Declaration, the agenda item number four would read ministerial statements. Uh, 4.1, signing of the Rovaniemi Joint Ministerial Statement and 4.2, statement by the Chair. With this change, can we approve the agenda? Agenda approved. And uh, uh, and then, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me now look back on what has been achieved during the Finnish chairmanship of the Arctic Council. Two years ago, I asked whether there would be smooth sailing ahead of us or whether we would be facing a stormy chairmanship of the Arctic Council. We have been able to sail together. Perhaps we sometimes had windy conditions, but that is what keeps the ship moving. Throughout our chairmanship, we have enjoyed the very cooperative spirit between the Arctic states and with the permanent participants of the Arctic Council. On matters related to the indigenous peoples of the Arctic, discussions with the Sami Council have been particularly important for Finland as a chair. I would also like to note the valuable input of the observers of the practical work of the Arctic Council. As was shown in the video you just saw, we set four priorities for our chairmanship. Environmental protection, meteorological cooperation, connectivity and education. During the last two years, the Arctic Council has achieved tangible results in all these areas. The Arctic Council working groups have continued to produce important information on the state of the Arctic environment. They have provided us with the up-to-date data on the rapid change of the Arctic climate and its effects on nature and people. The Arctic Council working groups and expert groups have produced recommendations on how to monitor the Arctic ecosystems and how to reduce pollution and minimize the negative impacts of human activities on the Arctic environment. During our chairmanship, we have put emphasis on reducing the emissions of black carbon. During the last two years, the Arctic states, the permanent participants, as well as many of the observers, have gained a better understanding of the issue of black carbon and the ways to tackle the problem. I highly appreciate this work. To accelerate the reductions of black carbon emissions, Finland had recently allocated resources to different regional and global black carbon reduction initiatives. In our opinion, the Arctic Council Project Support Instrument, PSI, is an important tool to work on practical projects. I am pleased to announce that Finland has decided to allocate 1 million euros to the PSI to support the cooperation of the Arctic Council working groups on the issue of black carbon and other types of pollution. Ladies and gentlemen, we brought meteorological cooperation as a new topic to the Arctic Council. Looking at the results achieved, I find that this was the right thing to do. The Meteorological Institutes of the Arctic States and the World Meteorological Organization have been ready to offer their expertise to the Arctic Council. 
I am pleased to see that the working groups, as well as the incoming Icelandic chairmanship, has welcomed the opportunity to utilize this cutting-edge expertise in their work. Improved meteorological observations help in enhancing climate science as well as in producing services that improve the safety of the people in the Arctic. This is particularly important in today's situation as more extreme weather events are expected to take place in the changing Arctic. We are likely to see more storms and flooding, as well as growing risk of wildfires, which are now increasingly addressed in the work of the Arctic Council. Enhanced weather and ice services are important for the safety of shipping in the Arctic. Human and environmental safety in shipping is one of the core areas of the Arctic cooperation. The agreements for search and rescue and oil pollution prevention in the Arctic are in force. And practical exercises supporting these agreements have successfully been carried out during Finland's chairmanship. The Arctic Coast Guard Forum is playing an increasingly important role to ensure good cooperation for the benefit of safe shipping. The Arctic Council has also contributed to the harmonized implementation of the International Maritime Organization's Polar Code. Finland's priorities of connectivity and education are key elements of the well-being of the people of the Arctic. During the Finnish chairmanship, the Arctic Council has continued to seek solutions to improve connectivity in the Arctic. It is obvious that emerging technologies, such as new satellite technology, need to be applied. The Council has produced an excellent report with recommendations for future work to attract investments for improved connectivity in the Arctic. The Arctic Economic Council is an important partner in enhancing connectivity and promoting sustainable economic development in the Arctic. The newly signed Memorandum of Understanding between the Arctic Council and the Arctic Economic Council will further strengthen this mutually beneficial cooperation. All Arctic inhabitants deserve equal opportunities for education. During the Finnish chairmanship, the Arctic Council and the University of the Arctic have together put an emphasis on the crucial role of teachers and modern teaching methods to reach this goal. This is an important step to ensure that all children in the Arctic will have equal access to good quality education that takes into account the cultural and linguistic diversity of our region. Colleagues, the Arctic Council has achieved much more than this during the last two years. All the achievements are listed in the over 100 page senior Arctic officials report to the ministers that will be presented for approval in this meeting. In conclusion, I would like to say a few words about the efforts to streamline the work of the Arctic Council. We have already agreed to address the marine issues in the Arctic Council in a more holistic way. Until now, our work has not resulted in general strategic plan. However, we have agreed on the need to continue strategic work and to review the different components of the Council. This way, we can further improve the efficiency of the Arctic Council to fulfill its mandate. Ladies and gentlemen, 
I would like to thank you all for the support you have given for Finland's chairmanship in the Arctic Council. The practical support from the Arctic Council Secretariat and its director has been essential. The senior Arctic officials and the permanent participant heads of delegations deserve our appreciation for their hard work during our chairmanship. And I must mention that some of them have worked for the best of the Arctic Council much longer than that. Finally, I wish to express my gratitude to Ambassador Alexei Harkonnen for being the skillful chair of the senior Arctic officials during Finland's chairmanship, as well as to the whole Arctic team of Finland. I'm proud of you. Thank you. <laughs> so that was something from Timo Soini. And then, ladies and gentlemen, I now present for approval of the senior Arctic officials report to the ministers with the Arctic Council achievements during uh, 2017 to 19 and with the work plans of the sub subsidiary bodies for 2019 uh, and 21. I see no objections. The SOR report of the ministers is approved. And then I propose we invite the International Maritime Organization as a new observer to the Arctic Council as recommended to us by the senior Arctic officials. Uh, I see no objections. The ministerial meeting has decided that the International Maritime Organization will be a new accredited observer of the Arctic Council. So decided. And then And in uh, 2018, the senior Arctic officials have conducted a review of those observers that were admitted between 2000 and 2013. The senior Arctic official recommend that all 18 observers that were reviewed will retain their observer status. I see no objections. The observer status of the 18 reviewed observers is re Affirmed. This is nice. <laughs> um, then we will now proceed to the signing of the Rovaniemi joint ministerial statement. And I ask the ministers to come to sign the joint statement following the seating order, beginning with Canada.
So thank you all, and I think, colleagues, we need some applause. <laughs> or at least deserve some. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, then we are going to the item 4.2. Uh, at this stage, it is my duty as the chair to provide a statement about our meeting. The statement has been distributed to you in the beginning of uh, this meeting, and it's not my intention to read it aloud here. I want to stress that the statement includes all the important developments that have taken place during the Finnish chairmanship, and it aims to provide a solid background for the Icelandic chairmanship to continue the work. This has uh, uh, not been negotiated, but in my view reflects well our discussions. So that is a chairman's statement. And then number five, statements from the Arctic states and from the permanent participants. Ladies and gentlemen, now the ministers and the permanent participants will give their sixth, six minute statements. It's not necessary to use all the time, but, uh, but uh, when you use it, use it well, and of course you do. We will follow the seating order, and I thus ask Canada to start. Christia, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, well, thank you very much, Timo. And let me start by thanking Finland for hosting us here so very warmly in Rovaniemi. Uh, Canadians will always feel very much at home in a hockey rink. And I want to uh, thank you very much, Timo, and your entire team for the excellent work you've done chairing the Arctic Council for the past two years. Uh, and let me start by saying that Canada is very pleased to support the excellent chairman's statement. So thank you for that as well. Uh, we look forward to working with Iceland uh, as you assume the chairmanship for the next two years. Uh, and I would like to say that Canada is very lucky to have particularly close relationships with Finland and Iceland, in part due to the very strong Finnish and Icelandic communities in Canada. Uh, and in fact, our historic ties with Iceland will be celebrated next week in the town of Gimli, uh, a very important town uh, for the Icelandic world, which will be hosting the Icelandic Festival of Manitoba just next week. Sergei Viktorovich, позвольте мне выражать от Канады глубочайшее соболезнование семьям и друзьям погибших в трагической авиаварии в московском аэропорту Шереметьево в воскресенье. Желаю скорейшего выздоровления всем. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here with all of you today to discuss the common challenges that we as Arctic countries are confronting. This is a pretty special club for all of us to be a part of. I know that all of our countries derive a real satisfaction from our northern identity. After all, the opening lines of the Canadian national anthem declare how proud we are to be the true north, strong and free. We are drawn to the beauty of the Northern Lights and the rich culture of the people who live here. I was pleased yesterday evening to have the chance to talk with representatives of indigenous people who live in Canada's Arctic and to hear from them the challenges they are facing and the opportunities they see. Because the Arctic is about more than its mystique. It has been a home for indigenous peoples for generations upon generations. And I would like to acknowledge the presence here of Monica El Kanayuk, President of the Inuit Circumpolar Council Canada, and Chief Bill Erasmus, International Chair of the Arctic Athabascan Council. Thank you, guys. Um, thank you for your work and for co-developing Canada's Arctic policies, including our international Arctic policies. We look forward to continuing this work, including by funding the continued participation of Canadian Indigenous groups in the Arctic Council. Earlier this year, Prime Minister Trudeau offered Northern Inuit residents an apology for the Canadian federal government's mistreatment of them during the uh, tuberculosis epidemics of the 1940s, 1950s, and 1960s. 
in the Arctic, Canada and Indigenous people will continue to work together to confront the often painful events of our past, as well as to protect our shared future. We must all draw on the wisdom and experience of the six Indigenous permanent participation organizations here today to help us build resilience to climate change to protect the North. The Arctic is warming much faster than anywhere else on the planet, and the effects of climate change are being felt most acutely here, threatening the way of life for Northerners, as well as the health of the whole planet. Le mois dernier, les scientifiques du gouvernement canadien ont publié la première partie d'une évaluation nationale des connaissances actuelles sur la façon dont le climat du Canada a changé et continuera de changer. Les résultats sont terrifiants. Last month, Canadian government scientists released the first part of a national assessment of the current knowledge of how Canada's climate has changed and will continue to change. The findings are terrifying. They are even more so for Canada's Arctic, where temperatures could increase by as much as 11 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. We can still reduce the pace and amplitude of these changes if we take action now. And that is what Canada is doing. We recognize that we cannot fix this problem alone, but we know that we have a responsibility to be part of the collective solution. As of April 1st of this year, every jurisdiction in Canada now has a price on pollution. This is a meaningful step towards reducing our national emissions. But pollution knows no borders, particularly in the Arctic, and so we must all act together. There have been some great collective achievements in the Arctic Council, notably, as Timo mentioned, rallying around a common goal to reduce emissions of black carbon. It is good news that all of the countries which report their black carbon emissions have reported a reduction. There is great economic opportunity to be unlocked in the Arctic, but this development, including resource development, must be done in a sustainable manner. To that end, I am announcing today that Canada will fund a permanent secretariat of the Arctic Council Sustainable Development Working Group as one part of a broader, more than $28 million investment in our Arctic foreign policy. Sustainable development is not only about environmental stewardship, it is also about ensuring that Arctic communities play a role in the economic development of this region so that it takes into account their health, cultural traditions and language, and so that they benefit directly from the prosperity that economic development brings. We all saw excellent examples of this work earlier today at the Working Group exhibition. Through the funding announced today, Canada will also provide more money to the University of the Arctic, the network of northern academic institutions that provide such valuable research to all of us. Our investments in our Arctic foreign policy are just a small part of the investments our government made in our latest budget to ensure that Arctic and northern communities continue to grow and prosper. That totals $700 million in new and focused funding over the next decade. Our Arctic foreign policy is focused in part on people and the planet. But make no mistake, we are not naive about the geopolitical, security, and defense issues that are also at stake. As with everything in the Arctic, all of these issues are interconnected. For example, unpredictable weather patterns caused by climate change are creating new security threats and are hampering our search and rescue operations. Canada is a staunch defender of the rules-based international order and the multilateral institutions that underpin it. Since its inception in 1996, the Arctic Council has been one such institution. Together, we have taken steps to address issues in a wide range of areas, including the environment, economic development, scientific collaboration, improving mental and physical health, preserving culture and language, and maintaining peace and stability. Canada very much hopes that all the countries gathered here today are as proud of our collective efforts as we are. Finally, Yesterday, when I met with the Canadian permanent participants, they told me that it would be good to hear some of their own languages spoken at this meeting. So let me end by saying, Masi Chu, that is in Dene and Gwich'in, Nakur Mik, that is in Inuktitut, and Kuyana Mini, 
which is in the language of the Inuit of the Western Arctic. And all of those words mean thank you very much. It's great working with all of you. This is an incredibly important organization for Canada. We're glad to be here. Thank you, Minister, for your profound remarks. And we will now proceed to the Kingdom of Denmark under Samuelsson, Minister for Foreign Affairs of Denmark, Arne Lone Bagger, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Greenland, and Paul Johan Sundberg Mikkelsen, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade of the Faroe Islands. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, colleagues, permanent participant leaders, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Kingdom of Denmark, I would like to thank our generous Finnish hosts for excellent guidance and cooperation during your chairmanship. Our cooperation, uh, our cooperation on, in the Arctic Council is not only a choice, it's a necessity, and we can be truly proud of our efforts so far. Despite many challenges, we must nurture this unique governance structure. Only then we can show the outside world that we are responsible and visionary Arctic actors. I would therefore like to express our clear support for the joint statement uh, as well as the chair's statement. I would like to highlight an area which is very important to the Kingdom of Denmark, our cooperation on economic development to the benefit of the Arctic population. Climate change and pressure on the natural environment presents challenges in the Arctic, but at the same time, new business opportunities are emerging. We should pursue those opportunities in a sustainable way. The Council has done important work on economic development, for example, on how to exploit new opportunities for connectivity, overcoming obstacles of long distance and remoteness, and thereby reducing the digital divide between the Arctic and most other places. The Kingdom of Denmark will work towards even more sustainable economic development. As a key element, I would like to point to the report on business finance in the Arctic, commissioned by the Danish MFA and carried out in cooperation with the Arctic Economic Council. The report identifies and recommends possible ways of creating better framework conditions that can lead to further economic development. I hope these recommendations will inspire and benefit all of us. Together with Greenland, the Faroe Islands, and the incoming Icelandic chairmanship, we look forward to taking a first step. We will engage young people in a competition on innovation in the Arctic during, the, uh, during 2019 and 2020. The aim is to promote entrepreneurship among young people across uh, the whole Arctic region. I would now like to pass the floor to Minister of Education, Culture, Church and Foreign Affairs from Greenland, Mrs. Anna Lona Baga, followed by the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade of Faroe Islands, Mr. Paul Mikkelsen. Thank you, Minister Samuelson. Dear colleagues, permanent participant leaders, ladies and gentlemen, firstly, I would like to thank Finland for the good cooperation during your chairmanship and congratulate Iceland on the upcoming chairmanship. I do anticipate a strong cooperation with our good friends and neighbors in Iceland. The Arctic region has an ever-changing environment with harsh conditions. However, we have lived and adapted for it for thousands of years. As an Arctic people, the Arctic is not a distant and exotic place. I can say without any doubt, for people in Greenland, Arctic is our home. The development of the Arctic has always been important to us. Our daily work as politicians is to secure a better future for our people. To achieve this, we, the Arctic nations, should continue to take the lead in exploring common solutions, because we need to find common solutions to the changing environment and to secure the well-being of the people in partnership. Here we see the Arctic cooperation as the key, and this is why we prioritize our work in Arctic Council. Our common work in the Council has shown that we all are prepared to work together in order to create the best possible conditions for peaceful development, securing both sustainable economic development 
and that delicate environment. From Greenland, we welcome the increasing interest in our region from all around the world, an interest when conducted responsible can benefit our people in many areas. Whether it's regarding science, education, infrastructure, commercial project, environment, or sustainable development, our co cooperation should create opportunities for the Arctic and future generations. Together, we can lead and facilitate a positive development across the Arctic for the benefit of the Arctic people. Thank you. Colleagues, uh, permanent participant leaders, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Chair. The seas surrounding the Faroe Islands, as well as, mo as most nations and communities in the Arctic, are a vital source of our economy and social well-being. However, our seas are vulnerable, and, and the radical change of our facing to the climate change and increasing activities in our region. For those of us living side by side with nature, marine pollution of plastic, chemicals, and particles is real and affects our daily life. May I therefore compliment the incoming Iceland chairmanship for di directing our focus to the oceans and in particular the op opportunities arising from making the blue bioeconomy a priority. Growth in the, in the blue economy um, completes us to ensure that the right balance between the biological uh, limits of nature and the sustainable use of our natural resources. Because of the sound protection of our, uh, our natural environment must be the key to economic growth in the Arctic. The Faroe Islands are fully committed to this agenda. We are excited to start sharing the best uh, and practical collaboration with visionary actors from the, across the Arctic region regarding to example for developing a new methods and innovative technology in the aquaculture and create uh, creativity uh, use of marine products in the gastronomy, design and fashions, and well invent in, uh, efforts to to manage the, the, the ever-increasing tourism in our region sustainable. However, trad traditional fisheries remain the backbone of economy in the coastal uh, uh, um, Arctic region. But I am convinced that there are some, some other smart ways to find from the, uh, the enormous wealth of our ocean resources. Our task as members of the Arctic Council is to view our cha challenges in the Arctic as opportunities and drivers of innovation rather than problems and issues. Again, I would like to thank the Finnish Chairmanship for its effort in hospitality, and I wish the Icelanders the best luck in the incoming Chairmanship. I look forward to our continued cooperation. Thank you. Thank you, Ministers. And uh, next in the speaking order is Finland. Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Environment, Hannele Pokka. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, dear friends of the Arctic. I would like to greet all delegations to participate in this ministerial, and I uh, also wish to thank the city of Rovaniemi for hosting the Arctic Council ministerial. It's, uh, it's good to be here where it all started in 1991 when the Arctic Environmental Protection Strategy was adopted. I'm also delighted that our meeting is here in my hometown. I grew up in a small village near Rovaniemi. My point to you today is that uh, if, we want to, if we want that the North stay vibrant, uh, it's important to ensure the conditions for people to live, work, and take care of their nearest environment. Rovaniemi is situated near the homeland of the Sami people, Sapmi. The participation of Sami in the Arctic Council, along with the other permanent participants, is ex extremely important to Finland. Mr. Chairman, our children are the future. Millions of young people around the world, including 
in all Arctic countries have called for strong actions to prevent climate emergency. Young people, children are looking us, adults. And the Arctic, the Arctic is changing unbelievably fast. Our countries, the Arctic states, are among the wealthiest in the world. We have the undeniable responsibility to speed up our climate action in order to keep the global warming within 1.5 degrees Celsius. We need to cut greenhouse gas emissions and we need to, grow, to do it urgently. An ambitious climate policy strengthens res resilience and improves the possibilities in adapting the global warming. Dear delegates, Finland is committed to carrying out an ambitious and uh, a smart mitigation policy. We will cut our emissions by 80% by 2050 and we aim to be carbon neutral by 2045. Entrepreneurs, researchers, universities, municipalities and various stakeholders are working hard towards a climate-friendly circular economy. Finland also emphasizes the importance of reducing emissions of black carbon. The reductions will bring significant health benefits and support achieving the targets of the Paris Climate Agreement. And investing in clean and energy efficient technologies is a very good business at the level of enterprises as well as societies. The UN Sustainable Development Goals are relevant, relevant also for the Arctic. Finland is committed to implementing the Agenda 2030 to support the sustainable future of the Arctic region. The Arctic Council's work on sustainable development is also important and was recognized only last week when the International Association for Impact Assessment awarded the Arctic Council with its global award. All Arctic states and permanent participants have pledged to maintain the Arctic as a region of peace, stability and constructive cooperation. We must also pay attention to the growing interest of non-Arctic actors towards the Arctic. Close cooperation between the Arctic states will ensure their necessary leadership in guiding the development of the Arctic region. Dear friends, the point of departure for Finland's chairmanship in the Arctic Council was exploring common solutions for, to common challenges. Uh, we think inclusive cooperation is key to success. That's why we invited the Arctic Environment Ministers and permanent participants to Rovaniemi last fall. That meeting underlined the importance of continuing the cooperation on climate change, pollution prevention and conservation of biodiversity for the benefit of both Arctic peoples and nature. Ministers presented their solutions to speed up the reductions of the greenhouse gas and black carbon emissions to re reduce marine plastic litter and to develop the network of protected areas, among others. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Finland welcomes the joint statement by the ministers and the statement by the chair as, and is committed to contribute to implementation. I would like to assure Iceland and Finland's support for its chairmanship of the Arctic Council. Finland intends to make use of our experiences in the Arctic Council when we take over the presidency of the European Union next July. The European Union is an important partner for the Arctic Council in supporting Arctic science and observations, mitigating climate change and promoting sustainable development. Dear friends, the Arctic Council is like a big family. Every family has, as we know, its moments. This family must keep together and look after our common good by protecting the environment, by promoting sustainable development, and by caring for the well-being of the Arctic communities. Thank you. Thank you, Hannele. And Iceland. Woodloigur Tur Tudarsson will be the next speaker, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to start by joining others in expressing our condolences to our Russian friends at the tra tragic air accident on, in Moscow on Sunday. Uh, dear colleagues, heads of delegations of the permanent participants, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me a great, great pleasure to be with you here in Rovaniemi today. 
Firstly, I would like to congratulate Minister Soini on the very successful completion of the Finnish chairmanship. Under Finland's leadership, we have been able to truly advance our mission in the Arctic Council in good cooperation with the permanent participants. The Arctic Council working groups and subsidiary bodies, as well as an increasingly large group of observers. We commend our Finnish colleagues on their work, great work. You have made our job a lot easier, and we look forward to building on your outstanding chairmanship and adding new value to the present work being done. Let me also state that we welcome the statement by the chair and the joint statement by the ministers. While I try to build suspense for the Icelandic priority areas, I want to emphasize the role that each of us plays in the well-functioning of the Arctic Council. Our common ground and common responsibility is the Arctic. Our duty is to work together. We may not all agree on every single issue, but I dare to say that we do share a common understanding, namely that the Arctic is an important region, not only to all of us present here today, but also in the context of global environmental developments. Our common goal is to ensure sustainable development in the Arctic, focusing equally on each of the three pillars of sustainability and emphasizing active collaboration and knowledge building. Looking ahead and trying to envisage what the future could hold for us, we know that scientific research indicates that we, that we can expect, due to climate change, more drastic changes to the Arctic environment in the next two decades than in the past 100 years. Even a fully implemented Paris Agreement is not expected to curb global warming until after the middle of the 21st century. As a result, we must anticipate that the Arctic ice will continue to melt and that ice-free marine areas will grow during the summer months. Adapting to the continuing warming of the Arctic and building resilience will be a major challenge for many of the small Arctic communities, not least to indigenous people and the ways of life. The Council focus on sustainable development and the scientific work that has been carried out by its subsidiary bodies has yielded an important basis for discussion on a variety of important issues. The Arctic Council has, for insta instance, increased and broadened our understanding of the Arctic ecosystem, enabling us to make informed decisions on how we approach the region's environment and resources. This is relevant to states outside the Arctic, which may explain growing interest in obtaining observer status in recent years. Growing international interest in Arctic matters demonstrates a dramatic change in international priorities from, from what they were just 15 years ago. The geostrategic situation in the regions has changed, and this reality is also reflected in the Arctic Council's international status and the attention that the work of the councils enjoys. It has evolved from being peripheral regional venue to being a truly central body for cooperation in the region. A changing climate poses new challenges and makes it increasingly important to ensure that the Arctic remains a low-tension area. While the Arctic Council does not address military security, it is an important venue for dialogue and peaceful cooperation in the Arctic region. Its clear mandate and regional focus on sustainab sustainable development and knowledge building has allowed, uh, allowed it to continue its work, irrespective of global political tensions. Our shared interest in avoiding military buildup or worse conflicts in the North cannot be overstated. In this regard, increased military activities in the North Atlantic and the Arctic are a source of concerns, reaching common understandings and solutions while respecting international law that governs the region and maintaining the stability that has so far characterized the region is of global interest. Working closely with all partners inside as well as outside the region is of utmost importance for both prosperity and security in Arctic region. <coughs> the conflictual elements that may result from opening up of the Arctic make the Council's contribution to sustainable development in the region increasingly relevant. In fact, sustainable development may be the single most important element to reduce tensions and thereby alleviate the risk of military buildup. In this respect, I truly believe that an active dialogue based on state-of-the-art scientific research 
conducted through dynamic collaboration between our countries and organizations is the best way forward for constructive development of the Arctic Council. Dear colleagues, leaders of permanent participants, organizations and observers, I very much look forward to introducing the Icelandic chairmanship priorities later here today, as well as to our continued and constructive debates. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Indeed, will we hear more about Iceland's chairmanship plans later. Now it is uh, the turn of Aliut International Association to give the remarks. The floor is yours. Um, Hi, ministers, distinguished guests, colleagues, and friends. On behalf of, the, of everyone at Aliut International Association, we would like to thank Finland for two years of leadership. We recognize the many projects and incentives that were completed under the Finnish leadership, and we would like to come commend the staff of the Arctic Council Secretariat, Indigenous People Secretariat, and especially Alexei Harkonnen. We have a unique relationship with our environment, subsistence, as well as commercial activities together sustained our way of life. We are an intricate part of the ecosystem in which we live. The Unangak people have been experiencing accelerated climate change in our region. We see this with warmer temperatures, earlier fish runs, and stormier weathers. This is important to note because it also shifts how we as Unangak people can continue to practice our culture. It is with these things in mind that we have been active in pursuing projects that complement efforts to document and plan for these changes. The CAF approved CONUS project that is focused on, <clears throat> excuse me, that is focused on subsistence mapping is one example of how we are working at the ground level to help our Arctic communities to build tools that they can use to influence policies which sustains our communities and resources for the future. It also allows for partnership building and dialogue to happen. This strengthens our relationship and helps us to carry out our mission of promoting con continuity of culture and protecting the resources needed to sustain it. That being said, the work of the Arctic Council is very important to the Unangak people of the United States and the Russian Federation. Our well-being and our culture is tied to the health of the marine environment as it always has been. Safe shipping, healthy biodiversity and understanding of what to expect from a changing climate are essential to continuing our way of life. The significant progress made on the utilization of indi indigenous knowledge in the Arctic Council has been encouraging, and we hope to continue to see this in the future. It makes a world of difference when we bring information about these projects back to the Unangak people, and they see that science is addressing indigenous people's issues and recognizes their relationship with the environment and how their knowledge continues to conservation efforts. One highlight of this two-year chairmanship was the hosting of the Arctic Council Working Group meeting in our region of Alaska. We would like to thank the U.S. chairmanship for the conservation of Arctic Flora and Fuma Working Group for bringing, for bringing the esteemed CAF board to Alaska in September of 2018. We are happy that others have gotten to see our beautiful home and meet some of the Unangak people. Alaska offers a glimpse 
into the rich history and culture of our Unangach people, as well as offers a view of significant presence of the commercial fishing and shipping industry that sustains the community economically. It is a true example of how culture and commercial activities work together and build our communities. The Aleutians are the gateway to the Arctic and our people have thrived in this area for millennia. We appreciate the opportunity to be here at this table with the many distinguished ministers, colleagues, and friends. We look forward to the Icelandic chairmanship and participating in the continued work of the Arctic Council. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And next will be the Arctic Athabaskan Council. Please, the floor is yours. Masi, uh, Mr. Chairman, Gamadonizin, Donchon, Slikadenizin, Gondetlon, Masi, Asanle, Ministers, permanent participants in our Athabascan language, I um, said that we're very pleased to be here to participate and make our, our views known and to continue being um, participants within the Arctic Council. Um, we want to uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, we are somewhat concerned and, um, and, and have disappointment that um, a declaration was not signed today uh, as we participated in the uh, uh, development of it. However, um, uh, sometimes uh, that happens and uh, we're coming to terms with that. Uh, we have uh, some real concerns. Climate change is real and uh, we recognize that we are in a state of crisis where we live in the north as residents permanent long-term residents in our homeland. Climate change is man-made, and our elders tell us that we are clearly in trouble. Our indigenous knowledge must be understood and be implemented to provide us comfort. By following our own knowledge, we have always prevented disaster. We have always had certainty and stability in our lands and territories. This way we are confident in our planning and with our way forward. Mr. Chairman, we are very concerned with the ever increase in CO2 emissions and the inability to meet agreed, agreed upon targets. Our children are expecting a bright future and they depend on us around this table. We have a duty to provide them with the best opportunities and certainty going forward. We are pleased and encouraged with the ongoing work and the many efforts of the working groups within the Arctic Council. However, as permanent participants, the ongoing issue of financial resources is still with us and, and needs to be addressed. We are encouraged that a minister's statement has been developed and signed by the participating Arctic Council members. However, this is not the common practice of the Arctic Council. The permanent participants usually have the opportunity to fully participate in the drafting and development of an Arctic Council declaration, where our views are fully, fully endorsed and part of the bigger picture. Finally, Mr. Chairman, we thank the Finnish chairmanship for the excellent hosts that they have been we also support the statement by the chair and look forward to its implementation. We also welcome the Icelandic chairmanship for the Arctic Council and look forward to their good work. Thank you for your cooperation. Masi, Asanle. Many thanks for your remarks. And uh, Kuichin Council International, 
will be speaking next. Please, the floor is yours. Van Quincy Shalaknai, good morning, my, my relatives. Shoshri Edward Alexander Ojitsa, which I was on Italy, Gatanan Kuchi. My name is Edward Alexander, and while I'm from Fort Yukon, I, uh, I live now in Fairbanks. And as I sit here today in Rovaniemi, the home of Arctic Cooperation, uh, a mere 5,200 kilometers from my hometown of Fort Yukon, I feel both the honor and the weight of being charged with the responsibility by my people to share with you, my distinguished colleagues, the views of our Gwich'in people on some of the most pressing, pressing issues facing humanity today. These are the state of our relations, climate change, and the cultural and linguistic survival of indigenous peoples who since time immemorial have had, had their histories and lives intertwined with the animals, the lands, the waters for both our physical and spiritual nourishment. When I began my remarks, I started with a term as Shalak Nai, which is the traditional way a Hekwe, a leader, always begins his or her remarks as a Gwich'in person. It means my relations or my relatives. We say it first to remind ourselves that our relationships come first, that this is why we are here. This is why we conduct our business, because quintessentially we must care for each other and our world like our family. Sometimes on days like today, we might need to be reminded of the paramount role relationship building plays in the North and the Arctic Council and in Arctic families and in that little bit of wisdom that has survived tens of thousands of years in the North because we respect every one of you today here and listening around the globe. Shalak Nai, I want my children and grandchildren and yours too and onwards forever to grow up to be able to say Shalak Nai, Tomorrow, my relatives, I will hunt for caribou. I fear that future generations will not be able to say, I will hunt for caribou tomorrow for two reasons. Because our language has been brutally repressed in the wake of decades of policy that punished our people for speaking which in, which we call Dinji Zhukka, the humble people's language, and also means the humble people's way of life. Or, alternatively, because there will be no caribou on the mountain, because the governments of today chose to value temporary profit over our relatives and our relationships that have sustained us since time immemorial. The United Nations has deemed 2019 to be the year of indigenous languages. The individual and collective effort of dedicated young people who seek to become the elders of the future, able to pass down our language, cannot be overlooked. But it can only be restored with the respect of all, with Shalak Nai. The right is recognized in the new United Nations Declaration on Indigenous Peoples in Article 14.1. Indigenous peoples have a right to education in their own languages in a manner appropriate to their cultural methods of teaching and learning. Shalak Nai. We owe it to our children to root them in a sense of self that is guided by their culture, give them the tools to repair the lines of cultural transmission that we so aggressively destroyed in the past by government policy. Not only do we need language transmission so that future generations can say nekaji vadzai enjit nahalri, we need for there to be caribou tomorrow and into the future. The future of the porcupine caribou herd, this unique herd which has the longest land mammal migration in the world, is threatened. This awe-inspiring migration has been put into peril by the insistence of the government of the United States of America to open the area to oil and gas development, despite the urging of both the Gwich'in and many of the governments here at this table. The Gwich'in directly and unequivocally call on our friends in the United States to immediately cease all efforts to issue oil and gas leases in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, and to ensure the preservation and the integrity of the calving grounds of the porcupine caribou herd and the Gwich'in people's way of life. This is why GCI was pleased to see an emphasis on strengthening circumpolar cooperation on environmental impact assessment as a recommendation in the Finnish chairmanship-led project on Good Practices for Environmental Assessment and Meaningful Engagement in the Arctic. 
GCI was proud to co-lead this project, which exemplifies the ability of the work at the Arctic Council to be impactful not only on a circumpolar or international scale, but to speak directly to the priorities of the Indigenous governments of the North, which in benefited not only from the product itself, but from the discussions sparked in our communities by the project and the access to research and expertise that it facilitated. For example, the project enabled GCI to commission a report on emerging practices of Indigenous rather than state-led impact reviews. The nations of the Arctic Council benefited from the integral knowledge of the permanent participants and that which you bring to the discussion with thousands of years of knowledge and, water and management of the land, the animals and the waters. And while Gwich'in stand opposed to development in Anwar, we are actively investing in developing renewable energy infrastructure in our communities. The Arctic Sustainable Energy Futures Toolkit, an SDWG initiative, and the first project proposed and led by GCI and the Arctic Council is a print and web-based guide for communities to follow when developing and exercising community energy planning processes. This step-by-step -step toolkit will transfer knowledge using best practices, resource guides, case studies, videos, worksheets, and template pathways to help communities create and implement their energy visions. This month, Gwich'in delegates will meet and officially declare a climate change emergency in our territories. Our animals are suffering, hunters are falling through thin ice, there's the Yukon River king salmon collapse, threatening our food security. Our permafrost is rapidly deteriorating, and we have unprecedented wildfires in our territories. GCI continues to believe that the Arctic Council is an effective body for seeking cooperation to take steps towards addressing this emergency. Much more needs to be done by us all. Climate change is why Gwich'in Council International has proposed that the eight Arctic states with the active participation of the six permanent participants, negotiate an agreement on cooperation in the mitigation of and response to wildfires, and better work to understand their changing nature of, uh, excuse me, the changing nature of fire ecology in the Arctic. Thank you, my relatives. Never forget the importance of our relationships, our families, all of our relations that make us leaders that inspires the people's trust in our governments. It is, in our perspective, the only path to a more just, peaceful, and vibrant world for us all and for all of our relations on the land, in the water, and in the air, which in around the world thank the Finnish chairmanship for their excellent leadership over the last two years and for the chairman's statement. And we also say thank you to the Finnish people for the warm hospitality and true kindness, as well as thank you to the member states, the permanent participants, the observers, to all of the work, excellent work coming out of our working groups. And we look forward to working with the incoming Icelandic chairmanship so that we can continue to say that we will always be able to say, Shalak Nai, Nekat Ji, Lidzai in Jit the Hongri, Asi Cho, Hai. Thank you very much. And now I give the floor to Inuit Circumpolar Council, please. Pagala Ipsi, Ariad Mani Tuud. Greetings, it's great to be here with you. Mr. Chairman, Excellencies, colleagues, friends, thank you for this opportunity in Robonimi, where the seed sown in June of 1991 grew to eventually become the Arctic Council. The Inuit Circumpolar Council represents the Arctic coastal peoples from the eastern tip of Chukotka across the top of the North American continent, including the world's largest island, Greenland. We number approximately 165,000 people. I'm from Utqiavik, the northernmost community in the United States, where the Chukchi and Beaufort Seas meet at Point Barrow. We are smack dab in the middle of what people like to call Arctic change. We have it all. Melting sea ice, thawing permafrost, 
stronger and more frequent storms causing erosion of our coastline. Today it's warmer and wetter. The Arctic climate has changed and the Arctic ecosystem is transforming before our very eyes. Arctic change creates problems for us in the biodiversity that, it adapted, that adapted to the Arctic climate uncounted generations ago. Our culture and life and way of life is under assault. The animals, birds and fish that we rely on for cultural and nutritional survivor, survival are increasingly under stress. We are worried for our food security. It's time to set the record straight. There is global climate change, and humans are responsible for much of it. That's the plain truth, and we don't understand those that would argue otherwise. We believe climate change must, will continue for the foreseeable future. We believe it's time to stop bickering over whether there's climate change or not, and start implementing strategies and actions to survive climate change. We believe it's time to stop hiding from reality. There are many topics that we can talk about under the overarching theme of climate, of Arctic change. Let me mention two topics that are definitely in conflict with each other, conservation and development. It's our observation both sides to this discussion continue to battle each other. Both sides have taken extreme positions with little room for compromise. There's little exaggeration and lots of fake news flying around this debate. Inuit believe people should live within and in collaboration with nature. Our viewpoint conflicts with the perspectives of the dominant society that arrogantly assume man can control nature. We can see where that approach has gotten us that approach has been dis disastrous for the Arctic and the rest of our planet. Unregulated run amok development is clearly not the answer. Neither are conservation strategies that would turn the Arctic into some giant open air nature park, suitable only for tourists. ICC believes it's time to get back to the original ideas of the Arctic Council, which promised a balance, a real balance, between sustainable development and environmental protection. There are people living in the Arctic, people desiring a healthy environment with safe food, air, and water, people desiring economic opportunity to provide for their children and families. It comes down to having a balance between development and conservation. It's important to include ICC and the other permanent participants in these critical discussions on climate change, sustainable development, and environmental protection. We have another perspective, a different viewpoint that could greatly benefit what the Arctic Council hopes to accomplish. The Arctic Council has garnered positive publicity due to the fact that indigenous people are seated at the table. This is truly unique for modern international organizations. We would say inclusion of the permanent participants gives the Arctic Council credibility. Indigenous participation helps the Arctic Council do a better job. However, participation is one thing, having influence is another. What good is participation if no one listens and our concerns are not being, being paid the attention we think they should be? The current situation within the Arctic Council is becoming a concern for us. The term meaningful engagement has a different meaning for the Arctic states than it does for the permanent participants. We would like to see the Arctic Council address some of the issues important to us. Wildlife management and food security, the infrastructure and social services deficit, physical and environmental health issues, including the horror of suicide, language and cultural protection. It's time to address the problems faced by Arctic indigenous communities. It's time to seriously listen 
to the solutions offered by ICC and the other permanent participants. And it's time to use indigenous knowledge as was called for at the beginning of the Arctic Council. We wish to express our thanks to the Finnish team and their strong effort leading the organization during their chairmanship. We pledge our support to the Icelandic chairmanship and promise to work hard to ensure its success. Finally, on a personal note, I want to thank Julie Gorley, the United States Senior Arctic Official, for her friendship and strong presence during her 14-year tenure. We will miss her. Thank you. Thank you uh, for your remarks. And next speaker will be the Russian Association of Indigenous Peoples of the North. Please, the floor is yours. Salsk. Спасибо. Уважаемые министры, постоянные участники и наблюдатели Атлетического совета, дорогие коллеги и друзья, для нас огромная честь сегодня принимать участие в столь значимой встрече. Позвольте поприветствовать вас от имени коренных народов России и выразить огромную благодарность Финляндии за проведенное председательствование в Арктическом совете, за высокий уровень профессионализма, организационное содержательное наполнение работы Арктического совета в этот период. Мы, коренные народы России, сегодня имеем возможность жить так, как жили наши предки, то есть сохранять культуру, язык, традиции. И большая работа в этом направлении проводится Ассоциацией коренных малочисленных народов Севера, Сибири и Дальнего Востока Российской Федерации. На сегодняшний день Ассоциация собой представляет мощную общественную организацию с разветвленной сетью из 37 региональных организаций коренных народов представляющих интересы 42 народов. Выстраивая конструктивный диалог, ассоциация служит проводником между коренными народами и органами государственной власти. Говоря о целях и задачах ассоциации, важно отметить ее упор на решение социальных и экономических проблем, вопросов, касающихся охраны окружающей среды, культурного развития и образования. Каждый из секторов работы определяет не что иное, как качество жизни коренных народов и их способность интегрироваться в современных в современную жизнь. Мы подчеркиваем, что устойчивое развитие Арктики, здоровье человека, защита окружающей среды, сохранение биологического разнообразия очень важны для наших народов. И вопросы по изменению климата, выбросы вредных веществ в Арктике необходимо решать совместными усилиями. Все заявленные темы, вся деятельность Арктического совета для нас являются актуальными и важными. Мы готовы продолжать работу в данном направлении. Всем большое спасибо за совместную работу. Желаем Исландии успешного председательствования в следующий период работы Арктического совета. Спасибо. Thank you. Спасибо большое. And uh, thank you, Raipon. The next uh, speaker is the Sami Council. Mr. Chair, Ministers, Indigenous leaders, observers, friends of the Arctic. The Sami Council would first of all like to congratulate Finland on its very able leadership of the Arctic Council. And Mr. Chair, thank you for your warm recognition of Sami Council in your opening remark. It has been a pleasure for us to, uh, to work with your chairmanship team. And I also want to mention how pri proud I am of our Summit Council delegation here today, including both elders and youth. And during this term of the Arctic Council chairmanship, has, the Arctic Council has actually received two global awards for its work. Firstly, the Gorman Cookbook Award for the best cookbook of the world in 2018, for the ELU, Indigenous Youth, Food Knowledge and Arctic Change Project, and just last week for the Arctic Environmental Impact Assessment Report that received the 2019 Global Award of the International Association on Impact Assessment. And Mr. Chair, dear friends, let us take a moment to also reflect upon that during Finland's chairmanship, the Arctic Council was nominated to the Nobel Peace Prize.
While we traveled here yesterday, the IPES released its global assessment with a clear message of an alarming rate of species extinction and nature's dangerous decline. The findings are horrific. It states that three quarters of the land-based environment and about 66% of the marine environment have been significantly altered by human actions. And on average, these trends have been less severe or avoided in areas held or managed by indigenous peoples. This tells the story of best practice for success that we could learn from in the Arctic. Cooperation and co-management between indigenous peoples and states as equal partners is indeed the best chance we have for an Arctic with high bio and cultural diversity, a prosperous Arctic for all. Adding to that, one of the findings presented in the WWF scorecard on Sunday points to that Arctic states continue to show an unwillingness to recognize indigenous peoples as equal partners in the management of the Arctic region. This shows there are challenges with implementation at national level, but unlike other regions in the world, we have the Arctic Council as a forum for cooperation. 2019, by the UN declared as the International Year of Indigenous Languages, which recently, by the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Peoples, has been expanded to a decade of traditional knowledge and indigenous languages. This provides a unique opportunity for Arctic Council to prioritize the indigenous languages. Our indigenous knowledge and languages are inextricably linked, both holding valuable knowledge, lessons learned, and know-hows related to biodiversity, climate change adaptation, and resilience. The environment to which the indigenous languages apply are changing dramatically, and we know that the Arctic indigenous knowledge and the inherent indigenous languages holds insights to address these changes, to adapt and to identify potential solutions that could benefit us all. The Summit Council will take an initiative on languages and will look for broad support for that within the Arctic Council. And finally, Mr. Chair, in the popular youth book series about Harry Potter, there is a wizard, Lord Voldemort. He's also referred to as the one who should not be named. If he is named, he might appear. And by naming the enemy, the wizards will put their lives at risk. But we would like to underscore that climate change and its impacts are nothing like Lord Voldemort that appears only if mentioned. For us living in the Arctic, we can tell you that it, it already takes place and it have great impacts on our lives. By mentioning it by its real name, we can fight it, reduce its impacts, and we do not even need magic. This room has the power and potential to agree on ambitious levels of reduction of emissions and set a standard for the rest of the world. And today, we need to express our deepest concern about the development of the commitment for this ministerial. In a time of great urgency, we, the Arctic states and the Arctic indigenous peoples gathered, gathered around this table are in the best position to make commitments to act in the best for the environment and the global humanity. Sami Council look forward to the Icelandic chairmanship and to a close cooperation with Iceland on their program. And Sami Council stands ready to contribute to continue to hold high standards of the work of the Arctic Council. Thank you.
thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker is Norway. Ine Eriksen Sareide, please. Thank you very much, Timo, and dear colleagues. I would like first to echo both uh, what Denmark and Iceland said about condolences to Russia for the terrible plane accident. I would also like to say, Timo, dear Timo, uh, that um, you have done wonderful work in your period as uh, chairman of the Arctic Council. And uh, we also, of course, look forward to uh, Iceland being at the helm uh, quite soon. I also think it is very good that you have presented a very strong statement as the chair's summary. The fact that the Arctic is a region characterized by peace, stability, and international cooperation is absolutely no coincidence. It's a result of the political choices that we have made every day from every country around this table. Those are choices that help us work together based on common interests, an agreed framework, and respect for international law and future cooperation, also with countries from outside the Arctic, must take place within these parameters. This is something that we have worked hard to achieve, and it is something we will work hard to maintain. The fact that all eight ministers are gathered for a ministerial, only for the second time in history, as I've learned yesterday, is a testimony to the importance we attach to the Arctic Council. And the Arctic is far more than ice and polar bears. The Arctic is people. The Norwegian Arctic is home to a tenth of our population. In cities throughout the Arctic, be it here in Rovaniemi, in Arkhangelsk, in Tromsø, in Nuuk, people live their lives, they raise their families, and they run their businesses. The Arctic Council is, an instrument, is instrumental in finding common solutions to the regional challenges we're all facing. And one of the reasons why the Arctic Council is a success is the fact that it gathers everyone concerned about life in the Arctic, including indigenous peoples. And since the beginning in 1996, shared perspectives on environmental protection and scientific cooperation have unified us in our commitment to a well-functioning cooperation. In order for us to address the challenges facing the region, we need the best available scientific knowledge to guide our efforts. Throughout its history, the Council has been instrumental in increasing our knowledge about the Arctic region. Under Finland's steady leadership, the Council has lived up to its legacy in developing new knowledge on the challenges facing the Arctic. This includes the pressing issue of climate change and the state of the Arctic Oceans. The climate change we see is dramatic in itself, but it also has dramatic long-term consequences. We welcome the Council's increased attention on the Arctic Oceans and appreciate the Council's work on marine litter and ocean acidification. We would like the Council to continue to strengthen its work on marine issues, and we welcome the new marine mechanism that has been established to promote this work. We also would like to acknowledge the new MOU with the Arctic Economic Council and welcome increased attention to sustainable economic development in general and the blue economy in particular. The Arctic Council contributes in a major way to continued stability and development in the Arctic. No one single country can solve the challenges facing the Arctic alone. And Norway continues to be a strong believer in building and working to safeguard effective multilateral cooperation. According to a good tradition we have, I will now give the floor to Silje Karine Mutka, who is member of the Executive Council of the Sami Parliament in Norway. Chair. Chair of the Arctic Council, Ministers, Permanent Participants, Their Excellencies, with Edith, good morning. I'm so happy to see you all here today in the middle of Sápmi, the home of the Sámi people. Ravaniemi, or Ravanyarga, as it is called in the Sámi language, means a land, tongue, or a nest where there was once a forest fire and which is now covered with young trees. This brings my thoughts to wildfires and climate change. Traditional knowledge and research shows 
that changes in climate, especially earlier snow melt, have led to hot, dry conditions that boost this increase in fire activity. We have recently experienced this in Norway, both last year and this spring. We also remember California wildfires in November 2018. Mr. Chair, SAPMI has in recent decades experienced major changes in our climate system. Our traditional industries and Sami culture are threatened by climate change. These changes are happening so fast that it's very difficult to adapt. We see impact both directly by a warmer cli climate and impact of new land use because of mitigation measures. Therefore, it is need for more support for adaption actions to limit the impacts on our communities and ecosystem services. Finally, this has been a meeting and a period that has been excellently chaired by Finland. The Sami parliament are happy that Iceland will chair the council for the next period. Our way to wish Iceland good luck is to say that the proud Icelandic name Finnboga has a Sami origin. It is about our historical strong hunting bow. Ologito, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, both of you. And uh, the Russian Federation, Sergei Lavrov, will be speaking next. Uh, Sergei Pasalst. Спасибо. <coughs> Уважаемый господин председатель, коллеги, друзья, прежде всего хотел бы поблагодарить финских соседей за теплый прием. Мы высоко оцениваем проделанную партнерами работу по реализации прагматичной, объединительной повестки своего председательства в Арктическом Совете. Хотел бы также в первых строках сказать о нашей признательности за те соболезнования, которые многие из вас выразили в своих выступлениях в связи с катастрофой с российским самолетом. На Россию приходится почти треть Арктики. Мы рассматриваем ее как пространство мира, стабильности, продуктивного сотрудничества. С удовлетворением отмечаю, что аналогичной позиции придерживаются все наши партнеры по Арктическому Совету. Видим в этом залог успешного развития Крайнего Севера, поскольку именно на арктических государствах лежит особая ответственность за то, что здесь происходит. Мы открыты для самого широкого сотрудничества в Арктике, где, как мы не раз подчеркивали, нет каких-либо поводов для конфликтов, для попыток привносить военные методы в решение любых возникающих здесь вопросов. Существующее международное право позволяет надежно обеспечивать национальные интересы всех арктических государств и внерегиональных стран. Также, безусловно, надо руководствоваться теми решениями, которые мы вырабатываем в рамках нашей организации. Стратегической целью России остается обеспечение устойчивого развития региона в трех измерениях – экономическом, природоохранном и социальном. И мы последовательно исходим из того, что хозяйственное освоение Арктики должно осуществляться в соответствии с высокими экологическими стандартами, при уважении интересов проживающих там людей, включая, конечно же, образ жизни коренных народов. Россия намерена содействовать повышению адаптации и устойчивости региона к глобальным климатическим изменениям, Минимизация антропогенного воздействия на окружающую среду, в том числе в русле реализации Парижского климатического соглашения и повестки Дня ООН в области устойчивого развития до 2030 года. Повышенное внимание следует уделять сохранению биоразнообразия Арктики, ее уникальных, но крайне уязвимых экосистем, предупреждению загрязнения на море и на суше, отработке практического взаимодействия арктических государств по совместному реагированию. В контексте быстрого развития в Арктике морской деятельности, судоходства, в том числе круизного туризма, важно и далее укреплять потенциал оперативного ответа на возможные чрезвычайные ситуации. Мы выступаем за расширение сотрудничества в рамках Арктического форума по линии береговых охран. Считаем полезными организованные в конце марта-начале апреля в Ботническом заливе многосторонние учения «Полярис-2019». Приоритетным направлением работы должна оставаться природоохранная деятельность. Мы приветствуем решение о продлении пилотной фазы инструмента поддержки проектов. Он зарекомендовал себя эффективным финансовым механизмом в деле осуществления проектов по сокращению загрязнения окружающей среды в Арктике, в деле продвижения практического сотрудничества в области экологии. 
исходим из необходимости продолжения начатой в период, в период финского председательства работы по подготовке стратегического плана деятельности Арктического совета, первого в истории организации документа перспективного планирования. Очевидно, что жизненно важные для Арктики вопросы, такие как повышение устойчивости региона к глобальным климатическим изменениям, минимизация антропогенного воздействия на окружающую среду, сохранение биоразнообразия, развитие телекоммуникационной инфраструктуры тесно взаимосвязаны между собой. Их эффективное решение требует более высокого уровня координации и комплексного подхода. В этой связи отмечу вклад финского председательства в развитие и укрепление синергии на площадке Арктического совета. Приветствуем тесное взаимодействие между органами совета, практику работы в объединенных форматах, подготовки совместных экспертных материалов и рекомендаций. Особо выделю сотрудничество с Арктическим экономическим советом, перспективной площадкой для привлечения инвестиций, развития бизнеса и инноваций. Мы заинтересованы в эффективном приносящим добавленную стоимость подключения наблюдателей к деятельности Арктического совета. Этот статус ко многому обязывает. Мы рады видеть в качестве нового наблюдателя Международную морскую организацию. В прошлом году в рамках пленарного заседания Комитета старших должностных лиц состоялась отдельная сессия с наблюдателями, в ходе которой они презентовали меры, предпринимаемые для борьбы с загрязнением Арктики и сохранения ее биоразнообразия. Считаем эту практику весьма полезной. Поддерживаем программу председательства Исландии, с которой в России имеются общие интересы в регионе. Это прежде всего проблематика моря, развитие морской биоэкономики и зеленого судоходства, борьба с морским мусором, включая микропластик, а также с закислением океана. Будем обеспечивать преемственность общеарктической повестки при переходе председательства в Совете к нашей стране в 2021 году. Будем добиваться реализации всех начатых под председательством Рикьявика инициатив. Как отметил президент Путин на Международном арктическом форуме в Петербурге 9 апреля, приоритеты нашего председательства в 2021-2023 годах нацелены на продвижение природосберегающих технологий во всех сферах. Соответственно, ударение будем делать на вопросах социально-экономического развития региона, разумеется, при сохранении должного внимания к экологической проблематике. Особо отмечу такие направления, как переход на использование сжиженного природного газа, возобновляемой энергетики, поощрение циркулярной экономики. Развивая в регионе судоходство, мощности по добыче, сжижению и транспортировке газа, намерены продолжать содействовать упрочению энергобезопасности Европы и Азии, улучшению качества энергобаланса в диверсификации транспортных артерий. В фокусе внимания будет жизнеобеспечение арктических населенных пунктов, включая их эффективное энергоснабжение, а также повышение благосостояния проживающих в Арктике людей, особенно коренных народов Крайнего Севера, сохранение развития их языков, культуры, традиций. Уважаемые коллеги, вызовы, с которыми сегодня сталкивается Арктика, требуют углубления межгосударственного сотрудничества. Об этом, в частности, шла речь на пятом международном форуме «Арктика. Территория диалога», который состоялся в начале апреля. Происходящие в этом районе мира перемены открывают для всех нас новые возможности. Важно ими правильно распорядиться во имя стабильного будущего региона, во имя благополучия людей. Россия поддерживает идею проведения саммита арктических государств, конечно, когда для этого созреют необходимые предпосылки. В заключение хотел бы еще раз поблагодарить Финляндию и пожелать успехов Исландии. Со своей стороны будем оказывать партнерам всемирное содействие. Благодарю за внимание. Thank you very much. Спасибо Польше. And then it's going to be Sweden. We'll follow as the next speaker. Margaret, please, you have a floor. Vasaku. Thank you very much, uh, Excellencies, uh, colleagues, uh, Arctic friends. I've um, listened carefully to uh, the wise words expressed by all friends of the Arctic gathered around this table. Uh, Arctic states and permanent participants, uh, all in the presence of excellent, hardworking Arctic Council experts and dedicated observers. Uh, and the message I hear uh, is clear. I hear a testimony about the importance of the Arctic Council to help keep the Arctic a region of peace, stability and international cooperation. I hear a testimony of the opportunities that this cooperation creates to 
realize the great potential inherent in this region. But first and foremost, I hear a testimony about the region of continued challenges and change. And yes, the scientific findings are robust. A climate crisis in the Arctic is not a future scenario. It is happening as we speak. And it affects all of the people who exist and work here. Everyday lives and prospects for the future. In Fairbanks two years ago, I posed the question what Mother Earth would say if she had a seat at our table. That she perhaps would remind us how the Arctic functions as our cooling system. Perhaps how concerned she should be by the fact that things are changing so fast. That only two decades from now, the Arctic Ocean could be largely free of ice in the summer that our planet has done all she can to dampen and absorb, to keep Greenland and the permafrost in Siberia intact, that she has sent us no invoices, but that this is about to change. If anything, this has become clearer since we last met in Fairbanks. The IPCC 1.5 degrees report speaks volumes. And on my way here, I read the Arctic Climate Change Update 2019, highlighting new findings. Annual air temperatures in 2014 to 2018 were all greater than any year since 1900. Sea ice volume in September declining by 75% since 1979. This all demonstrates the importance of a fact and science-based approach and the urgency of action. Needless to say, making observations are not the same thing as taking action. Our current and future to-do lists are daunting. But something has happened. Perhaps a global tipping point of awareness and dedication has been passed with the emergence of an inspiring new generation of climate activists, the Greta Thunbergs of this world. The 15-year-olds having to tell us what we have to do. And the fact that climate change is man-made should paradoxically give room for some optimism. It's in man's and I think women's hands to do something about it. And thank you very much for always, as indigenous peoples here, giving us um, the reminder of how we are links in a chain. Uh, and I really hope that uh, um, my grandson will be able to see a living polar bear. He's so interested in animals and in nature. So it is also personal. It is personal for you, but it is also for us. We are all, de all dependent. We all know the Arctic region is not an isolated land of ice. It is not only wild nature and harsh landscapes. It is a region very much defined by the people living here. The Swedish Arctic is reindeer herding, important mining and top universities. It is breathtaking environments and popular tourist destinations, high-tech IT installations and space industry. I invite you to come and see for yourselves, actually. In October, Sweden is pleased to co-host with the European Union an Arctic forum in our northern city of Umeå, back to back with the Barents Euro-Arctic Council Ministerial, and I hope to see you there. The North should develop and its people be able to lead good lives, just as in any other part of our communities. And this underlines the need for sustainable development, economic, social, and environmental. With science-based policies and with the Paris Agreement and the 2030 Agenda in place, we have a solid base from which to do so. Our common goal to save the Arctic requires new scientific research, business innovation, shared priorities, and political will. We need to take many determined steps towards a sustainable future. And largely, 
over the years, I think the Arctic Council has succeeded in building a political environment that generates win-win solutions. So it's with regret I note that this year we did not manage to agree on a joint declaration. The challenges in the Arctic will require an even closer cooperation, and I pledge that Sweden will continue to support a strong Arctic Council. Dear Timo, I want to thank you and your team for a job very well done and for the generous, hos generous hospitality bringing us here. And I want to support your chairman's statement from this meeting. And to good, uh, good luck and count on us. We're definitely in this together. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Margot. And uh, the United States, Mike Pompeo, will be speaking now. Thank you. Thank you, Timo. <clears throat> Foreign ministers, uh, permanent participants, Arctic Council observers, uh, it's great to be with you here today. President Trump sends his regards as do the American people. Uh, the United States is proud to be an Arctic Council member, uh, and we're proud to be an Arctic state. This forum that we're in today embodies many of the characteristics that we'd all like to see in multilateral forum uh, all around the world. It's built on the bedrock principles of individual sovereignty, voluntary cooperation, and shared responsibility. As I said in Brussels in December, the United States want, wants multilateral institutions that hew to their missions and serve the interests of the nation states that created them. From this sturdy foundation, valuable accomplishments are within our reach, as our Finnish friends have proven through their two years of exceptional leadership. When the United States held the chair, the Arctic states signed a science cooperation agreement to facilitate the movement of scientists, equipment, and data across our borders. The first meeting under this new agreement was convened here in Finland just a few months ago. This strengthens our ability to cooperate on scientific endeavors that will benefit all of our peoples, from improving weather forecasting, to studying outer space, and to learning more about the planet and the resources beneath our feet. We've also conducted joint exercises to prepare for possible marine oil pollution incidents, and we've increased our search and rescue capacities and preparedness, which has already helped save lives. To build on these and so many other successes, it's up to each member of this council to ensure that our underlying bonds of trust and responsibility remain unbroken. That includes the United States. We can always do better. The Trump administration has sought to engage the Arctic with renewed vigor, openness, and respect, as I spoke about at length yesterday. America's new Arctic focus prioritizes close cooperation with our partners on emerging challenges including the increased presence and ambitions of non-Arctic nations in the region. In addition to sharing our vision, I also came here to listen. I've appreciated this opportunity today to hear from each of you, including on topics that we don't always agree on. Even on those topics, I think it is the case that we tend to agree much more than we disagree. For example, the Trump administration shares your deep commitment to environmental stewardship. In fact, it's one reason Chinese activity, which has caused environmental destruction in other regions, continues to concern us in the Arctic. The Arctic has always been a fragile ecosystem, and protecting it is indeed our shared responsibility. But once again, the keys are indeed trust and responsibility. Collective goals, even when well-intentioned, are not always the answer. They are rendered meaningless, even counterproductive, as soon as one nation fails to comply. Regardless of whether a goal is in place, the United States strives to operate with honesty and transparency. Though we are not signing on to the collective goal for reduction of black carbon, America nonetheless recently reported the largest reduction in black carbon emissions by any Arctic Council state. We are doing our part, and we encourage other states to do the same and to do so with full transparency. That's true for every issue before this Council. Under President Trump, the United States seeks candid engagement and close cooperation. I want to close by thanking everyone involved in this council, government officials, delegates from the permanent participants, secretariats, observers, and invited experts. And I would like to again thank you, Timo and Finland, on a highly productive chairmanship. You and your colleagues have set a high bar for Iceland, and I'm confident that Reykjavik is up to the task of matching it. I look forward to many more shared accomplishments for our nations in the years ahead. Thank you, Timo.
Thank you, uh, Secretary of State. And uh, this concludes the statements from the Arctic states and the permanent participants. And we will now proceed to the presentation of the Icelandic Chairmanship Program. And uh, now I even invite Minister Gudlaugur Tur Turarsson to present the Chairmanship Program for 2019-2021. Gudlaugur, uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Timo. Your Icelandic is getting better every day. <laughs> but, uh, dear, <laughs> dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I am very pleased to take the floor again in this esteemed gathering, and this time to present Iceland's chairmanship program in the Arctic Council. Arctic affairs are a top priority in Iceland's foreign policy, and chairing the Arctic Council brings a unique and much welcomed opportunity for Iceland to let, lead the collaboration between the member states, the permanent participants and the observers within the Council. Rotating the chairmanship of the Arctic Council is an excellent way of regularly engaging member states in the Arctic Council affairs. It provides an opportunity for the chairmanship to further engage in Arctic issues at the international arena as well as domestically. We look forward to the task and we'll do our utmost to live up to your expectations. We will build our chairmanship on the ongoing work of the Arctic Council. Most of its ambitious projects will continue and our approach as chair is to highlight certain aspects of the Council's already ambitious agenda as well as to introduce a new field of cooperation through specific projects. In the spirit of the Ottawa Declaration that founded the Arctic Council 22 years ago, sustainable development will be the guiding light in our chairmanship program, which we present under the heading Together Towards a Sustainable Arctic. Sustainable development is built on three pillars, the environment, the economy and the people, and as we see it, the Arctic Council should continue to address all those pillars in a balanced balanced manner. In our chairmanship program, we have highlighted four main priority areas. First, the Arctic marine environment. It should hardly come as a surprise that Iceland will keep the oceans at heart during our chairmanship. I even dare to say that few nations have a deeper appreciation of the importance of a healthy marine environment than Iceland. The largest part of the Arctic region is covered by oceans, and the welfare of a large part of the population in the Arctic is based on the sustainable utilization of marine resources. The Arctic Council working groups have carried out many important ocean-related projects, and Iceland will focus on continuation and further development of projects in that field. Iceland is particularly interested in strengthening Arctic Council cooperation on mitigating plastic pollution of the ocean and is planning an international scientific conference on the topic in Reykjavik, Iceland in April 2020. Iceland also wants to introduce a new project focusing on innovation and efficient utilization of marine biological resources, or the so-called blue bio economy. Experience has shown that through innovation and biotechnological biotechnolo solutions, it is possible to increase significantly the utilization level of biomass taken out of the ocean. When done right, this is good for the environment, strengthens the economy, and has positive effect in the communities. Our second priority concerns climate and green energy so solutions. We will be continuing Finland's emphasis on improved weather forecast in the Arctic. I would in particular like to mention a project on mapping glaciers and providing more accurate information on the dramatic glacial reduction being witnessed in our part of the world. The impending shift in energy sources from fossil fuels to renewable energy will be important, both for reducing greenhouse gas emissions and for improving air quality in Arctic communities. 
Iceland aims to for further work to be carried out based on the ARENA project and continue to seek practical green energy solutions for small communities in the Arctic. Our third main priority will be on the people of the Arctic and their de desire to build prosperous and sustainable communities. The Arctic Council has a strong history of promoting sustainable development and growth in communities in the region, and we wish to continue cooperation on matters like gender equality, connectivity, and adaptation and resilience. In the coming decades, adapting to continuous warming of the Arctic will be a major challenge for many other small Arctic communities, not least the indigenous people. Last but not least, Iceland will continue to work for a better and stronger Arctic Council. The Arctic Economic Council will celebrate its five-year anniversary during Iceland's chairmanship, and we plan to seize the opportunity to enhance the collaboration between the two councils. We will also give due attention to the inner workings of the Arctic Council by maintaining the close consultations between member states and the permanent participants and continue to use innovative ways to engage with observers in a hands manner. It re remains important for prosperity and security in the Arctic region to work also closely with partners outside the region. Ladies and gentlemen, we are dependent on a close and peaceful cooperation that stretches across borders and boundaries. The Arctic region is governed in a cooperative manner, not least on the basis of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Peaceful cooperation in the Arctic should continue to be at the forefront as we better realize the extents of the ever-growing changes in the region. The fact that the eight Arctic Council member states, along with the six permanent participants and close to 40 observers, have been able to insulate our cooperation from negative fallout or various differences that have influ influenced most other international fora is very important. In this way, the Arctic Council has been an important venue for political dialogue and peaceful cooperation in the Arctic region. The Council's clear mandate with its regional focuses on sustainable development in the Arctic has allowed uh, it to continue its work irrespective of global political tensions. Ladies and gentlemen, interesting and challenging times lies ahead of us, and I remain, remain optimistic for our, good, for our continued good cooperation within the Arctic Council. The most important and representative body on Arctic affairs. Iceland is privileged to take over the chairmanship from Finland, and I want to thank you Timo, for your personal engagement and commitment. The fact that we have all the ministers present only for the second time is important. That gives a strong foundation on which to build our work for the next two years. We look, we look forward to working with all of you together towards a sustainable Arctic. Thank you. Thank you, good Gur, and. Uh... And uh, ladies and gentlemen, it has been a pleasure for me to chair the Arctic Council for the last two years. As we heard from the statements today, it is everybody's intention to continue the constructive and productive work of the Council. I now ask my friend and colleague, Woodlaugur, to join me at the podium so that I can hand over the chairman's gavel to him. Iceland has prepared ambitious chairmanship program, and I wish you all success during your chairmanship. So uh, thank you all, thank you very much for 
for a good uh, and constructive meeting. This uh, meeting is adjourned, and I must use this one because good luck took my <laughs> baton. So uh, this meeting is adjourned. And we will now have a media opportunity, and at one o'clock I invite you all uh, to join me for lunch. Thank you.